The topic today is actually uh, uh, pitfalls in the management of uh, uh, CKD. Uh, so I think uh, this is a very uh, important thing to understand because uh, what, I, what I'm uh, trying to expect is to uh, expect is a, a sort of a practice change. So after this lecture, within the next 45 minutes, I hope that your current practice will change uh, drastically uh, with the most uh, available uh, updated evidence uh, and also uh, which, which is sort of practical to our setup. Uh, so the topic is actually chronic kidney disease, the pitfalls in the management. So I have uh, slightly changed the topic, myths and truths. Uh, so I have just put a small quote, you can think about it. Your truth is the myth that deceives you and your patients at all times. So we will uh, find uh, the what it says at the end of the uh, session. So I think uh, you are you have you might have not have seen this sculpture uh, physically, but this is actually situated in the largest temple, uh, which uh, won the Guinness Guinness record Guinness record uh, for the largest comprehensive temple in India. So this is a story about this uh, blind men and the elephant. I know you all know about the story. So they interpreted the elephant uh, as a snake, as a wall, as a log, like that. So what is important here is uh, when you see uh, something uh, from one a particular angle, or when you don't see the totality, you don't see the truth. Uh, you don't get the clear picture. So what is important even in CKD management is to look at the total picture rather than uh, looking at one side, one part. So that is what is meant uh, by the myth. Okay, so we are going to talk about 12 myths uh, with regard to CKD, 12 myths in CKD. Okay, the, so I'm going to go by number one, two, three, four, five, six, then you can easily remember them and we will discuss one by one, which is very, very important, very, very practical. So myth number one, you are having low EGFR, you are a CKD case. So this is actually something uh, that I, ha I have come across a number of times. So doctors, whenever they look at a patient's report, if they find the EGFR is 40 uh, in an uh, old woman, for example, you might say, so you might tell like that. And the mother will sort of glance at you and see what's happening. Your kidneys are now shutting down. It's working very low. EGFR is low. Now you might need dialysis, you might need transplant, or you might have to face a lot of difficulties, discomforts. You might tell like that. So be aware, you are having low EGFR, you are a CKD case. Before labeling or diagnosing a patient, you have to ponder about certain things. So there are two scenarios I'm going to talk about in diagnosing chronic kidney disease. First, we have to differentiate chronic kidney disease versus normal aging because normal aging can mimic chronic kidney disease. Second, a patient, a person who has a huge muscle mass can have a falsely low uh, EGFR. So in that case also, you might falsely label a patient as a, a person as a chronic kidney disease person. So let's uh, look at this. So chronic kidney disease, uh, if you look at the age, now, what you have to know is, after the age of 40 years, in a normal individual, in this graph, you can see the GFR falls down gradually. You can see this line. So, if you are about 80 years, you can even have, have an EGFR of 50 uh, because uh, of the normal aging process. So, this is not CKD. For example, a 70-year-old patient coming to you and you check the single treatment, it is 1.4. Recording in progress. Have, and you uh, uh, you uh, actually check the patient uh, EGFR and the EGFR comes, sorry, one mic is not muted. Uh, so uh, you find that uh, the EGFR is uh, 40, 50. So what happens is you think that the patient is having CKD or you think the patient is uh, having a chronic kidney disease, low EGFR, so it's a problem, but it could be normal given the age. So always before labeling a patient as a chronic kidney disease, you need to you need to have a thorough evaluation before labeling. So this is important literature finding here. So they have found there is no increased risk of mortality for elderly with EGFR between 45 and 60. 
So if you find age for a 45, you might think the patient is having CKD with age, but it is normal. So don't label, don't, don't jump and label that this patient having CKD unless you have done other tests to confirm it. So the other thing is actually, I will give a story. I think uh, two weeks back, one of the nursing officer's brother came to meet me, who is uh, waiting to go to Korea and uh, he has done his um, normal medical checkup. And he came with, with a creatine report of 1.6. So he was referred to me by a physician telling that the patient is having low GFR, EGFR, please kind value your opinion. But to see him, he's 22 years and his uh, serum creative 1.6, EGFR was low, less than 60. And actually he's a bodybuilder. Then I have asked him to stop the exercises for about three days and repeated the serum creatine, which was 1.4. Then I went to it and did the urine ACRs and uh, uh, ultrasound scan KUB to see if there's any abnormality. Of course, everything was normal, perfectly normal. So remember, a person who has higher lean body mass bound to have low EGFR. So this is one study which shows that the EGFR is underestimated whenever you have a higher lean body mass. So a very uh, a patient with a higher muscle mass, you bound to get a low EGFR, which is not CKD, which is a healthy subject. So don't jump and label that you have CKD or you have a problem with your EGFR. Actually, this young chap, when he came to me, he was actually frustrated, upset that he was very much afraid that he's having CKD, but he was uh, fortunate to learn that it is actually normal. Uh, the EGFR is normal for his uh, body weight. So these are important when you diagnose CKD. So just wonder about this slide. Lower EGFR is not always indicative of chronic kidney disease, particularly in the aging population. So don't label them as CKD. Secondly, falsely low EGFR occurs in healthy subjects with higher muscle mass. So with that, we are going to talk about the myth number two. Once CKD diagnosed, they should be on 1-alpha and calcium carbonate. This is the normal notion I have seen. In many peripheral clinics, when I see patients with low GFR, they start straight away start on 1-alpha, calcium carbonate, aspirin, atravastatin, sodium bicarbonate, allopurinol. Some people call this, this is the CKD regime. So there's, not, there's no such thing called CKD regime, of course. What is important here is starting 1-alpha calcium carbonate over a longer period, now they have found it increases the mortality with cardiovascular events, with more strokes, more cardiovascular disease. I will show data now. So if you just do an X-ray of a patient who is on dialysis or who is on end-state renal failure, you will find the vessels are very clearly visible, just as if he has undergone a coronary angiogram of the vessel. So it is because of the calcium all gets deposited in the media of the uh, vessels. So, which will give rise to hypertension, which is resistant at the same time, uh, which will give rise to increased cardiac mortalities, ICH, and cardiovascular disease. Of course, so it's important that you should not start calcium carbonate or 1-alpha merely because the patient was diagnosed having CKD. So, then what is the right time? Now, just look at this study. Uh, now, these are uh, some of the most recent data from the KDGO guidelines. So, this two graph shows that if you start a patient on calcium carbonate, the survival or cause mortality is high compared to patients who are not on calcium. So, calcium carbonate is actually a killer. So, uh, this graph shows this graph shows that the patient who are on dialysis, if you start on calcium carbonate, the survival and also if you don't if you start on a non-calcium based non-calcium based phosphate binder like a cephalama the prognosis or the, the the patient's survival mortality rate is much much lower compared to the other one so it is important that uh, you don't use uh, the uh, phosphate binders calcium phosphate based phosphate binders unnecessary so when you should start calcium carbonate it's a very important thing when to, when to start so if you look at the guideline, KDGO, the most updated guide, it will very clearly say like this. It should be started in CKD state three patients, stage three to five, but that is also, read this very clearly, decisions about phosphate lowering treatment should be based on progressively or persistently elevated serum phosphate. So it's very important that 
unless the serum phosphate is elevated, you are not going to start on calcium-based phosphate binders. It's very important. Do not start on calcium carbonate unless the serum phosphate is persistently elevated. That is very important. Uh, so that is one important thing that we have to know. So by the way, why do you start calcium carbonate? What, the, what, is, the, what is the intention behind that? What are you going to correct by starting calcium carbonate? So very important, we are starting calcium carbonate not to correct the calcium. We are not going to correct the serum calcium. Don't look at the even don't look even look at the serum calcium. The idea is it's a phosphate binder. We have to lower the serum phosphate. Why should you lower the serum phosphate in CKD patients? Because serum phosphate, higher serum phosphates is clearly associated with uh, uh, kindly switch your, my, mute your line, mute your Zoom connection, please. Kindly mute your Zoom. Okay. Kindly mute your Zoom. Okay. So we are going to, so it's very important that we do, should not use any uh, calcium based phosphate binders uh, unnecessarily because higher phosphate is related with risk of death, cardiac mortality. That's why we start on calcium carbonate to lower the phosphate, not to correct the calcium. Another important thing, although the serum calcium may be normal or maybe the, uh, maybe the cal serum calcium may be uh, even uh, low, but it does not mean the patient is having a low calcium. It doesn't mean that we have to correct the calcium because whatever the calcium we are giving, it is already deposited in the body. So total calcium uh, mass in a given person may be high in spite of the fact that the serum calcium is low. So correction of serum calcium is not accepted at all. It is just to control the ph phosphate. If you of course can start a non-calcium based phosphate bind like a several level or lanthanum carbonate that is the best. That is the current standard of practice but unfortunately we don't have those things uh, available in the country at an affordable price. So uh, so what you have to remember here is excess calcium is a killer. So we start calcium carbonate for renal patients to avoid cardiovascular death, to reduce the incidence of death. But actually, by starting calcium carbonate, we are increasing the cardiovascular death. So it is very important always correlate with the lab report, serum phosphate, to decide whether you are going to start calcium carbonate or not. So what about vitamin D? One alpha. So if you look at the older guideline, they will say in the CKD state three and five, if the pH levels are high, you have to start on one alpha. But the newer guideline, they have changed it. So look at the highlighted part. It says, we suggest calcium analogs or calcitriol not to be routinely used. It's very important not to be routinely used because use of one alpha increases the serum calcium level, these calcium get deposited in the blood vessels and give rise right to increased incidence of death due to cardiac mortality, cerebrovascular mortality. So you should start 1-alpha only if the pH level is known to be persistently elevated. So can we do pH in our population for all the patients? We can't. So we have come out with a simple algorithm which is practical, practical for our setup. So just remember this slide. In a given CKD patient, if the phosphate is persistently high, you can initiate a phosphate binder. It could be calcium carbonate. But importantly, check the calcium, avoid high calcium. Secondly, if the alkaline phosphatase is high, you can infer that the patient's PTH is also high. Then you can initiate 1-alpha which is not the ideal treatment, but that is the practical, affordable approach in our setup because we can do a alkaline phosphatase, but it's very difficult to do a, a PTH level in our setup. So I think this is very helpful and it will change your management hereafter. So whenever you see a CKD patient, if they are on 1-alpha, if they are on calcium carbonate, kindly stop them. It's very important, kindly stop them. As a nephrologist, my job, is not to start 1-alpha calcium carbonate. My job is to stop 1-alpha and calcium carbonate. That is very, very important. So stop them. Check the phosphate, check the calcium, check the ALP, 
and start it whenever it is needed. Don't run them unnecessarily. It's very important because it's going to kill the patient. It's going to curtail the lifespan of the patient. Okay. Next, we are going to call, talk about myth number three. So let's see what it is. That's about metabolic acidosis. Of course, may, various studies, this is one of the study published in the Journal of American Society of Nephrology. So it shows very clearly that a patient, the, 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 the number of years a patient can live without dialysis increases when the acidosis is corrected. The patient is not symptomatically acidotic, but of course, uh, if you uh, if you detect that the patient has acid, underlying acidosis asymptomatic, if you correct it by giving sodium bicarbonate, of course, what will happen is their survival is better. But what I have seen is some of the physicians, of course, they start sodium bicarbonate without knowing or checking whether there is underlying metabolic acidosis or not. So the guideline says very clearly, we suggest, with the KDOKI guideline, KDCO guideline, we suggest in CKD to check the plasma bicarbonate level, venous bicarbonate level, and then to supplement with bicarbonate to normalize it, but not to blindly start it. So you should not start sodium bicarbonate blindly. If you have any patient who is on sodium bicarbonate, kindly stop them, do a venous bicarbonate, it's about 750 rupees. It's really worth doing it. And then get the bicarbonate report. If it is less than 22, start it, otherwise don't start it. And when you start it, adjust the dose just to maintain the acid base balance at 22, not more than that. So what I have usually seen is when a patient comes with a label of CKD, his phosphate is normal, Calcium is normal, ALP is normal, bicarbonate normal, but you start on one alpha calcium carbonate, sodium bicarbonate. Because of the sodium bicarbonate patient is giving gastritis edema, then what you do, you automatically uh, put them on omeprazole and domperidone. Then the patient complains of edema, you start on LASIX. Now the, you are doing a sort of a polypharmacy. You are increasing the number of medications, you are causing a disease, and to treat that disease, we are adding another, another, pharmacological, another pharmacological agent. Like that, the patient is getting a huge list of uh, a sort of a seven to eight uh, long list of uh, drug list, uh, so which is actually not necessary for the patient. So it's very very important if you have CKD patients. Now it's time to stop medication, check the levels, and to start it appropriately. That is the key message here. So next we'll go to the myth number four. Epo deficiency is the commonest cause of anemia in CKD. Actually, this is something we have to correct ourselves. I have seen after coming and working here that EPO is one of the most misused drug. Patients who should not be on EPO are on EPO. This is a big mistake. So let us understand when to start a EPO erythropoietin correctly. When to start erythropoietin correctly. Just look at this cartoon to understand this. Imagine there's a, a factory, which is a garment factory, and the production is the clothes. So to produce clothes, you should have raw material. That is the cloth. So cloth comes, you put to the factory, and you produce. And if you find, if you find, and these, these are the people who are sort of uh, making orders to produce more and more garment, more and more frocks, more and more production. So, uh, so if you if you if you want to if you see that there is less number of uh, garments, less, less, less number of shirts, frocks, whatever the, the final items, the production is low, then what do you do? What is the commonest reason? Maybe they don't receive enough raw materials, so you have to give them more raw materials. Or maybe there are no enough workers in the garment factory. But usually, do you increase the number of managers? Do you do that? No, that's wrong. You do not increase the number of managers or the people who do orders to increase the production. What you have to do, first you check the raw material, then you check whether there are enough number of people to work. Just like that, just like that, the same thing I'm showing, the bone marrow is here, the bone marrow is like a garment factory, and erythropoietin is like the manager, and iron beetle folic are the, 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 the raw materials, and the RBC is the final production. So if you find a patient is having anemia, you don't increase the number of bosses who is telling, produce more, produce more, produce more. No point in telling like that. What you have to do is you have to give the, you have to find the cause. Why this anemia is, it's a very important thing. So I have seen beta thalassemia patients getting erythropoietin, unnecessary. I have seen iron deficiency patients 
getting erythropoietin, which is unnecessary. I have seen folic acid deficiency patients, uh, uh, B2 deficiency patients, patients with GIBs, patients with myelodyspatia on erythropoietin. So underlying cause, without correcting the underlying cause, sometimes we prescribe erythropoietin. So remember, erythropoietin deficiency is not the commonest cause of anemia and CKD. Okay, it's not the commonest cause. So you have to find out whether there's iron deficiency, which is very, very, very important and correct it. So let me take you through, then how do you start? So how do you very, uh, take this into your mind very clearly? When do you start EPO in a CKD patient? So in my experience, in a patient who is non-diabetic, until the creatine comes to about 700, 800, they can maintain a hemoglobin more than 10, provided you correct the iron, you correct the B12, you correct the folic acid, you find the cause of the anemia, you correct it, you can maintain without any EPO. So we have been doing it for the last five years in CKD area. But for diabetic patients, their EPO requirement comes earlier. So when the creatine reaches somewhere around 400, 500 in a 60 year old male, then usually you need EPO. But in that case also, we have to start it after correcting the other courses. So coming back to the question, when do you start EPO? When do you start EPO in a CKD patient? So, uh, so the uh, short answer is you have to start EPO once you have excluded all the other causes of anemia in CKD. So I'm going to show you a very uh, simple pathway, how to work it out. So if you find in a particular patient whose hemoglobin is 10 or over 10, you are not going to start EPO. That's very clear. If it is less than 10, then it is one trigger, one uh, hint to say you that you, have, you might have to consider uh, starting EPO. So you're not going to start with the hemoglobin less than 10. So next, what I'm going to do is just take a, take, check at the MCV. It's a very simple thing. Look at the mean corpuscular volume. If the mean corpuscular volume is around 60, 61, 62, 63, usually associated with the high MCH or normal MCH, the patient is going to have beta thalassemia. So if it is the case, they are tolerating that hemoglobin of 6, 7, or 8, what is the average hemoglobin of the beta thalassemia trait, you should not start EPO based on that. Okay, so it's very important to look at this. So I expect from now onwards, if a patient is on EPO, you might have to stop them and look at the MCV. Just look at the make, make it a habit. Whenever you put the hemoglobin, put the MCV value in front of that. Look at the MCV. If it is very low with the normal MCHC or with the high MCHC, then the patient might be thalassemia trait. We have thalassemia bait overlapping in this primary streak. So it's very important to know that. Secondly, if the MCV is between 70 and 80, it may, and with a low MCHC, it might be the case the patient is having iron deficiency. Of course, you can support your uh, diagnosis by doing uh, serum iron studies with a saturation less than 25%, or maybe serum fetching level less than 500, then you will know that the patient is having iron deficiency. So here, the appropriate management is not starting EPO, but to correct the underlying iron deficiency. It may be the case the patient having normal MCHC with that MCV, so it may be anemia of chronic disorder, which may not be necessarily CKD. It may be due to anemia of chronic disorder, some other illness, maybe rheumatoid arthritis, maybe some other chronic illness. So you might have to correct that, add an, uh, address to, into that. So it's very important. Then if the MCV is high on the high side, you should always think about whether the patient is having B12 deficiency, folic acid deficiency, or some other cause. So after going through this approach, you have to, you are going to basically exclude the other causes of anemia. And then if you don't find, then you can think of starting EPO. But what is important to remember here is, I will repeat it again. What is important to remember here is that if you start EPO in a patient who is iron deficient, still the hemoglobin will improve. If you start EPO in a patient who is having B12 deficiency, folic acid deficiency, giving rise to anemia, if you start on EPO, still the hemoglobin will rise because there are more orders and the, whatever the remaining people, they are working hard and hard. But that is at the cost of 
hypertension, increased cardiovascular disease, increased uh, risk of stroke. And if it is a diabetes patient, it is at the increased risk of vascular thrombosis. EPO is very expensive. And there are people who need EPO, but they don't receive the enough EPO because it is, a, it is maldistributed. It is used by people who should not be using. So EPO is something that is very much uh, misdistributed, maldistributed among the CKD population. It's very important to rationalize the EPO, not because of that maldistribution only, but it is harmful. It is a harmful drug. It is a chemical that we are inserting into a person, uh, so it may not be the appropriate action. So you should always take the appropriate action to correct the anemia in CKD. So, so I have seen, I have already discussed these things. So one point I have to uh, highlight here is that inadequately iron treated patients, for example, you find a patient who is having anemia hemoglobin less than 10, we will say his EGFR is 15. And you find that the patient is iron deficient, you give a one dose of IV iron, maybe 100 milligrams. And then you find that the hemoglobin is not picking up, you straight away start on EPO the next day. That is a very wrong way of managing patients because you should make sure you have fulfilled the iron stores before starting on EPO. It's so important. For example, if a patient comes with the end stage with a, a serum treatment of uh, thousands and the patient is having anemia, of course, then you don't have to look into all those things. You can straight away start from EPO. At the same time, you can replenish the iron stores, B12 folic acid, because there's not enough time for you to wait until the anemia gets corrected. So it's important to find out the side effects or the bad effects that you're going to encounter in a given particular patient and if you don't start on EPO on right time. That is also important. So you have to balance uh, the effect of uh, not starting, not correcting anemia fastly, because anemia, you know, it can give rise to angina, heart disease, worsening of the kidney dysfunction. You might have heard about the renal anemia, cardiovascular vicious circle that will operate. So it's very important to correct the anemia on the right time. Uh, hello, I think one of your the Zoom needs to be muted. Uh, so I think we have about uh, one minute left. Uh, so after that, I think we have to rejoin. Uh, so I'm just reminding you that we have to rejoin uh, in about uh, one minute, roughly in about one minute's time. Uh, so what about the guideline says? What does the guideline says use of is e EPO in patients? So address, just read about it. Address all correctable causes of anemia. These are KDQ guidelines, including iron deficiency inflammatory state prior to prior to initiation of ESA therapy. ESA therapy is erythropoietin stimulating therapy. So that is very important that you correct all those things. But at the same time, you should uh, sort of weigh the, you have to sort of balance the ill effects of not start, not correcting the anemia at right time. Okay, so uh, we'll go to the next myth. Myth number five, we have uh, seven more left. Okay. Uh, so I think in about a minute's time, we have to restart and join the Zoom again. Uh, so if uh, the lecture gets interrupted, uh, we will I'll just uh, remain with this uh, slide until it gets soft stopped and we can reconnect, rejoin and uh, join uh, the next uh, 40 minutes, of course. So these are very important because uh, some of the doctors, of course, some of the, even the patients, most of the patients carries these myths with regard to this chronic kidney disease. So this is about the lifestyles, uh, the daily things. So first thing, fruits, green vegetables should be avoided in chronic kidney disease. This also sort of a traditional teaching and most uh, nutrition uh, dietitians used to give this uh, advice to CKD patients. Okay, uh, so uh, just because you label a person as having CKD, you can't uh, stop uh, giving them fruits, green vegetables, uh, sour things. Uh, so uh, the myth is that uh, should uh, fruits, green vegetables should be avoided in CKD, which is very wrong. Uh, so even uh, so, what they have found in research is that uh, taking a balanced diet is very important in CKD patients to boost their immunity and for their cardiovascular health, as well as it reduces the progression of chronic kidney disease. So, in the name of protecting the kidney, we are doing more harm by uh, curtailing the amount of fruits, green vegetables that we are taking. So, potassium is very important uh, mineral which reduces the blood pressure. It's good for kidney health. So potassium is not harmful, although we think like that. 
So actually, we as doctors, we all aware that potassium is not going to kill the kidney, but the heart. But of course, the fact that most people didn't know, I am going to divulge it now. So please listen to it very carefully. If a particular person has a very good urine output, a very good urine output, a normal urine output, the high potassium is not going to kill the patient because kidneys can excrete the potassium as long as the urine output is good. It doesn't matter whether the potassium is 6, 6.5 or 7. Of course, usually when you see a potassium of 6.5, 5.8, you are sort of upset about it and you feel that the patient is going to die. But that is not the truth. So if it is a true thing that most people, see the patients should die at the community, at the paddy field, wherever, by hyperkalemia. But that is not happening. That has never happened. So people who die with hyperkalemia are the people who have high potassium more than seven sometimes, and those who don't have a good urine output and their creatines, their EGFRs are very low, maybe three or four with a creatine of thousands over that, and who are not on uh, regular uh, renal replacement therapy. So remember, potassium, we have sort of an unnecessary fear on potassium. So actually avoiding potassium containing fruits, green vegetables actually does harm rather than good because because of the potassium we can't avoid the other uh, the important ingredients which are available in fruits and vegetables that's a very important message so i do advise my patients to eat more and more fruits green and vegetables and it is guided by uh, it's the, the advice is actually guided or modified by patient by patient depending on their potassium levels and in a particular given person i might tell you might have to cut down the potassium containing food for a shorter period but you can resume it later so it's very important that you don't cut down cut down it totally but rather you have to uh, give it in a moderately or you might you allow as much as uh, fruits vegetables as possible avoiding hyperkalemia in an oliguric patient or a non uh, or, or sort of an aneuric patient so that's the important thing the other important thing uh, is uh, the myth number six regarding high protein diet. So this is actually something that we have not understood all this time. So you should avoid high protein diet in CKD patients in, in order to reduce the phosphate on one hand and secondly to reduce uh, the burden on the kidneys. So that is the rationale behind curtailing the protein diet. But that is actually completely mistakenly understood. So what they say is the KD go very clearly says the potassium the 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 protein content in your diet should not exceed 1.3 grams per kg per day. Just calculate it. When you calculate it, it comes to about uh, nearly about uh, about 60 grams of uh, protein per day. So 60 grams of protein per day means, for example, if you take an egg, it contains about seven grams of protein. Uh, so you can definitely take about eight, de eight eggs per day if you're taking eggs as a protein content. So uh, uh, there's an easy way that you can calculate the amount of protein that you can take for a CKD patient. For example, uh, if you take your palm, the palm size, uh, one third of your palm size, if you take a piece of meat uh, or some uh, uh, protein content uh, food, high biological level protein content food, one third of that equals to 20 by gram, 21 grams of protein. So 21 grams of protein you have to take per meal. So you have to get to get actually one palm, palm size of uh, meal uh, protein content per day. So per meal, you are permitted to get one third. So in our population, how many people, how many of them are taking uh, such amount of protein? So for example, you have to take uh, one egg in the morning as a breakfast. You have to take one third of meat, chicken or fish in the lunchtime and you can take you should take at least a, a piece of a, a fish or a, a egg at the night time daily basis that is the protein requirement in ckd patients so we have wrongly advised them to cut down the protein context which is actually really hazardous because ckd is the catabolic state so we do not receive enough amino acids protein in ckd patients so why have we given a wrong message to our patients? Why these patients have got a wrong message? Because, because this message and these studies are done in Western population where they take about 1.8 grams of protein per day. So their diet is uh, composed of a high protein diet, 
but our diet is uh, composed of a large portion of carbohydrate, not on protein. So uh, the advice given to the Western population does not apply to our population. So the advice I give to my CKD patients is increase the protein content in your diet. So this is exactly the advice that we had to give. Okay, next talk about the next uh, myth. Myth number seven, CKD patients should avoid exercises. They should not, they should not do hard exercises. They should not run. Uh, they should not uh, go to the paddy field. They should not take a mammati. Uh, they should not uh, go to the field and work. They should not ride a, bis uh, drive, ride a bicycle. So those uh, uh, ideas are among, uh, particularly with the patients and the caregivers. So you, you should address it. Importantly, people with CKD who do regular exercises, they do better. Their blood pressure control is better. Their cardiovascular health is better. And of course, if you look at the, uh, the, the KDOK guidelines, they very clearly say, we suggest that patients with high BP and CKD be advised to undertake moderate intensity physical activity for a cumulative duration of at least 150 minutes per week. At least, at least, that's the minimum, 150 minutes per week. Or, or to the level compatible with their cardiovascular and physical tolerance. So it's very important to you encourage patients with CKD to involve in physical activity. So CKD is not a disease that we should stop doing work. To, it's not an indication or hint to say, take leave. It is not a recommendation to give low weight, a low, uh, low physical activity job. So actually, People with CKD should work, they should exert themselves, they should be highly active physically. Of course, I have enough examples. I know of a, a doctor's father who was on three times week dialysis from Anuradhapura, and he was actually a very active man physically, and their uh, daughters and the sons were really amazed to see his father without any urine output on three times week dialysis. He is doing an amazing job by building a house for his daughter. Uh, so that is uh, one example. A second example is a farmer uh, who is having no urine output on CAPD, going with a mammary to the uh, the paddy field to work until the uh, afternoon and the uh, children came to meet us uh, with an amazement. I can't imagine how did my father works with a CKD without any urine output having the CAPD and he's working very well. So very important people who do work and do exercise, that's they, they can do better with the CKD. So CKD is not a disease that curtails the exercise capacity. Myth number 12. So many doctors don't have this myth, but of course the patients. When I counsel patients, they say, uh, many people think that the long-term intake of antihypertensives like losartan, enalpril, a lot of drugs, and of course the diabetic medica medications like metformin, that causes CKD. So people tend to stop uh, drugs like antihypertensives uh, taken to uh, glycemic controls, uh, thinking that long-term intake of these drugs cause CKD. This is a, a very popular myth among uh, patients. So it is very important the nursing officers, the doctors, to educate about this particular myth in patients. Then they will have better compliance and adherence to the medication that we prescribe. What is important here to highlight is, it is not the losartan that is causing the CKD, but it is the fact that the blood pressure is not controlled in spite of the losartan. That is the cause of the CKD. So people do get CKD or they progress with the chronic kidney disease merely because the blood pressure is not controlled, merely because the blood sugar is not on target, merely because they have heavy protein area which is not tackled with, which is not uh, assessed, which is not treated. So it is not the drug that is causing the kidney problem or the progression, it is the parameters which is not properly checked, not properly marked. So what is the advice that you can give to the patients? Patients are coming once in two months. They check their blood pressure. Maybe their blood pressure is good at that time. But if a particular interested patient maintains a separate book, my blood pressure recordings, separate book, my blood sugar control, and the patient self-checks the blood pressure, self-check the blood sugar, then they will know whether their blood pressure is controlled or not, whether their blood sugar is actually controlled or not, you will see their blood pressure are not controlled. It is only the clinic date that the blood pressure is controlled. Maybe that is also not there. 
So if the blood pressure is not controlled, in spite of the fact that they are taking the medications, how can you expect a lower progression in CKD? You cannot. So it's very important to remember that, highlight that these targets are very important. We should educate the patients that these are the targets that you have to achieve in order to reduce the progression and reduce the time that you are going to get uh, to prolong the duration of uh, dialysis-free uh, years. Myth number 12. So this is another very important thing. Now, if you look at the KDOCO guidelines, it says it, gives, it, it, it comes up with this pyramid to suggest uh, the treatment, how to approach a comprehensive treatment approach uh, in a patient who is having CKD, what is the management approach? So you can see in this pyramid, this cube, the bottom line includes what? Diet, exercise, smoking cessation, weight loss. So lifestyle and self-management. So that is the large area. That is the big part. But the drugs, first line, second line, third line drugs, those are not as important as the lifestyle modifications. Are we doing this? That's the important thing. Because what we have been seeing is, and what is the notion among the society is, that when you have CKD, you need some pills. Patients are expecting some pills, some chemical compounds to intoxicate themselves. And the doctors are geared to write prescriptions. So that is our idea. But that is a wrong approach. What is the right approach? Talk to the patients. Make sure they have they are adhering to the risk factors, because non-communicable diseases, including chronic kidney disease, is not due to a pill deficiency. Remember, our patients does not have empagliflozin deficiency. They don't have metformin deficiency. They don't have losartan deficiency. It's a wrong idea. But what they have, they have exercise deficiency. They don't have, a, a, they don't get a balanced diet. They smoke. They don't have a weight control. And they don't avoid the nephrotoxic ducts. They don't avoid the nephrotoxic uh, circumstances, the climatic climates. That is the important thing. So remember, in CKD management, what is important is lifestyle modifications. It should be the first thing. Unless you address the lifestyle modification, and you're going to focus only on the drugs, then what's going to happen? It's like a house you have built up without a good foundation. It's going to collapse. That's what actually happening. Just look at a diabetic patients. What happens? You are start seeing a diabetic patient, start on metformin, start on glycoside, then insulin, then they lose their eyesight, then they, are lose their, they get the amputation, they get a MI and they die. Isn't that the story in most cases? It's a story. Very sad situation. Why is that? Because we are giving pills. People are expecting pills. We don't address the bottom line, the most important thing, which is very clearly demonstrated in guidelines. First thing is first. What is the first thing? Lifestyle modification. If you have risk factors, please do correct the risk factors. So nursing officers, doctors who are doing the renal clinics, non chemical disease clinics. It's very important to do health education. Very important. Make sure you have some sort of a guide. You can make your own criteria or guidelines or scoring systems to make sure the patients are adhering to the exercises, diet. Keep them on those lifestyle modifications for some time and check whether their parameters are coming down. Reduce their salt intake. Check whether the blood pressure is getting controlled. Do a weight control and check whether the blood pressure is getting, getting controlled. Ask them to avoid nephrotoxic drugs. Keep them very hydrated and check whether their creatins are coming down. Look at that first. And drugs are only secondary, only secondary. So it's very important because nowadays it's a, it's a very sad situation because lifestyle modifications are often forgotten by doctors. And we have gone into a polypharmacy practice. Of course, there is the commercialization bias. Very unfortunate situation is all these evidence-based medicine that we have and we worship and we discuss in the hi-fi conferences is actually directed as per the fundings by the pharmaceutical companies. 
they don't fund on exercise and security prevention because it doesn't do any benefit for them. If you fund for a SEL2 blocker, if you fund for a losartan, of course, that will benefit. So you will say, okay, take losartan, take SEL2 blocker, but not about exercise, not about hydration, not about smoking cessation. Very important. We have forgotten what needs to be done and we are doing something else. I think you have heard a story, uh, a, a, sto a small statement, a quote in Sinhalese. We say, Paya Baravaya Pitikara Behead Bendavagi. It's very important that we are doing the same thing. The ailment, the underlying root cause is something, but we are treating something else. So we should, should change this practice. I think this should be an eye opening uh, statement. We should, or we all know this, but still we, we behave as if we don't know it. It's very important to change this practice. Okay, then myth number 10. Hemodialysis is associated with poor outcome. This is a normal notion many people have. I do, as a medical registrar, a nephrology registrar, I had the same notion, hemodialysis, of course. The quality of life is very poor. But once I traveled abroad, I found the first my hemodialysis patient is a karate master. And the second hemodialysis patient is a, is a sprinter. So I was really amazed to see what's happening. Then I realized, actually, it is not the error or mistake of the hemodialysis. It's not the mistake of the hemodialysis. It is the mistake of how you do it. If you just compare the two things, if you think this train is the hemodialysis, and here you can see the Westerners, they are getting into the train very comfortably. The books, the train books, the seats are pre-booked, and they're prepared with all their luggages, and they're very safely entering into the train and they can have a happy, safe journey. There is in Sri Lanka and in India, what happens? We have a train and you can see people all over. So people are put on hemodialysis. It's the hemodialysis center is overloaded. Patients are unprepared and they start on dialysis very late. They get into the train very late. So how can you expect a good quality? You can't expect. Is it a mistake of the train? No, it is a mistake of how prepared you are, the amount of facility that you have. So I will show an important uh, uh, a study done in US from 2006 to 2010. It's an old study, but it's very important. They have examined for nearly uh, 4.4 million incidents in dialysis patients, it's a large number, it's a very large number. And they, they have divided these dialysis incidents into two categories. People who do well on hemodialysis and people who do not do well in the hemodialysis. And they did a retrospective study to find out why some people on hemodialysis do well while the other do, others don't do well. And they have found this amazing answer. There was 25 reduction in the first year mortality if the patient had a nephrologic care up to a year before starting dialysis. And if the patient gets more than one year of nephrologic care before starting dialysis, the mortality rate, rate reduced by 40% on hemodialysis. So it was attributed later to early creation of fistulas, better management of anemia and CKD, MBD, and also CAPD as an early option, as well as for kidney transplant. So what I want to highlight the point here is, if you refer a patient who is uremic confused, their brain are gone, their lungs are not working, their heart is compromised because of the end stage. Now, as nephrologist, if I see that patient for the first time, if I am to start on dialysis, that patient is not going to do well. Here is the data. And if you refer me a patient when the EGFR is about 60 or 30, and if I can optimize the patient while the patient is asymptomatic and prepare the patient, and if I then put the patient on a proper RRT mode, maybe CAPD, maybe hemodialysis, that patient will do well. And that patient will not know what is a nephrological emergency. So our target should be to put on a patient on RRT without letting the patient know that what is short of breath, what is uremic encephalopathy, what is nausea in uh, CKD. So you should not allow a single CKD patient in a routine clinic to feel or experience the unpleasant experience of uremia. You should start RRT on the right time and the right way and with a, with a, a proper preparation. So I don't have time to discuss about the preparation because of the interest of time. 
So next we'll go to the myth number 12, the last one. Okay, peritoneal dialysis is inferior to hemodialysis. That was a notion some time back. I think now in biomedistic, of course, people like peritoneal dialysis as opposed to hemodialysis. Uh, just to compare, just for your knowledge. Uh, if you take a peritoneal dialysis, it's just like this woman who owns the garden and she, her, she cleans her garden, her own garden every day and keeps it clean every day. Just like peritoneal dialysis. We do dialysis in peritoneal dialysis every day. Daily basis, we do the exchanges. And the room is clear, the garden is clear. Every time, every moment it's clear, so you're happy. Whereas if you leave these people, the municipal council people, and you wait until them to come to your garden and clean your stuff on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, it is just like doing hemodialysis on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Of course, and on Saturdays and Sundays, you have to lament. You have to be very unhappy. You have to keep your nose shut like this because you are waiting for others to come, just like hemodialysis. So a famous and pioneer nephrologist in the name of Claudio Ronco uh, from Italy, he says, intermittent hemodialysis is a crude punishment to CKD patients. A crude punishment to CKD patients. Actually, he's now experimenting an artificial kidney at the moment in Italy. So it's true. Although we are unaware, we, we reduce their fluid intake, we reduce their salt intake, their quality of life is very poor with intermittent hemodialysis. Compared to that, peritoneal dialysis, they can manage themselves, they can manage their own CKD of their, at their own space at home without coming to a center, without uh, spending too much on transport and hi-fi dialysis. So finally, I would like to tell uh, an important myth, which, I, which, which is an important point rather than a myth, which is not included in this slide. That is, remember that most CKD patients remain asymptomatic until the last stages. They remain asymptomatic with regard to the kidney dysfunction. So they don't feel anything physically, but the diagnosis of chronic kidney disease causes the trouble. When you diagnose a patient as having chronic kidney disease, people take that diagnosis and create a mental a tumor, like a cancer, which says CKD, 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 CKD. And the people always think I got CKD and how I'm going to look after my family. I'm going to get dialysis. I'm going to get short of breath. So they are with fear. So they live with this diagnosis and the fear for ages, which will give rise to a sort of a somatization disorder. And they come up with various symptoms of neck pains, sleeplessness, irritability, anxiety, dryness like feeling, not feeling well at all, all this because of this somatization disorder. So because of this mental uh, turmoil with the diagnosis that they get CKD, they suffer, they get symptoms, they become very symptomatic. They have a huge heaviness in their heads because of the diagnosis itself. So it is not the kidney that is having CKD troubling the patient, but that is the brain which thinks I'm having CKD is giving all the trouble. That is a very important thing to realize when you communicate with the patients. So divulging diagnosis of CKD should be done with utmost carefulness. You should not divulge the patient is having CKD unless you confirm it by proper testing. It's a very important message to uh, give. So let's look at the summary. So I think we have done in time. So if you have been sleeping, you can wake up and look at the summary to get the ideas. So first thing, do not label as CKD just because of the low EGFR. So do the other tests, ultrasound scan and UFR. Initiating calcium carbonate 1-alpha sodium bicarbonate should not be based on the mere diagnosis of chronic kidney disease, but by the lab values. Look at the lab values. Erythropoietin stimulating agents are vastly misused in our community so should be started only after excluding other causes of anemia. Very important. So we should start this practice long from day onwards. Dietary restrictions are needed for a minority of CKD patients and should not hinder their normal nutrition. So once one leaflet on diet in renal disease 
uh, from uh, you uh, from Edinburgh I read very recently it says the first sentence is there is no such thing called renal diet it's very important there is no such thing called renal diet whatever you can eat you should eat that is the encouragement okay lifestyle modifications are the cornerstone in managing non-communicable diseases not the chemical pills so always remember talking to patient educating the patient assessing the patient's lifestyle changes is the most important thing not the drugs that they are taking i'm not telling drugs are not important we need them at some point but what is important as a first line treatment is the thing that we have to start first and then you have to secondly go to the drugs if they are not responding uh, depending on the patient's circumstances so with that i think we have completed our slide and the last one also uh, yeah my computer is writing that prognosis on rrt improves with timely referral to an frd service so that actually of course we are doing already so it's very important message to all the physicians who are catering renal patients to refer them on time to get the proper management so i think uh, with this i think you should be able to change your practice uh, to stop unnecessary treatment and then uh, I think you will realize uh, what I uh, mentioned in the first slide. So let me, uh, Dr. Shamli, let me give uh, one minute just to thank my teachers, uh, Dr. Tilak Kabe Sekara on the uh, left hand side, who inspired me with his work by patient care as the key thing. The, he doesn't treat a TKD case, but he treats a patient with human feelings and emotions. So he showed me not by teaching, but by his exemplary life. And next, I have Dr. W. M. Bazil, who is a very senior consultant nephrologist in Kandy, currently working, and who gave me the uh, informative part, the knowledge part of uh, renal medicine and the clinical part of renal medicine. I should thankful to him uh, for, uh, for his uh, marvelous work. Then I have my foreign uh, uh, advisor, and my supervisor is Professor Neil Turner, who is actually the uh, professor in renal research and uh, of course he's the author of the oxford textbook of renal medicine uh, for his uh, uh, i mean for his uh, guidance uh, to uh, help me uh, in this endeavor so just as a uh, uh, gratefulness i'm going to thank them uh, i'm going to make it the opportunity to thank them at this time